Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett Augustine. I'm an a, a business advisor for North Central Texas Small Business Development Centers, which is a leading provider for assistance for small businesses. We're happy you could all attend today. And we are grant funded, which allows us to offer this webinar and many others at no cost to you. We're happy for everybody that could take a moment to take some time out for their own company to try to make themselves better at managing it. And today we have some really fun stuff going on with how to build a high quality email list. For those of us that have been in business for a while know that how important that is to keep up with clients and keeping our relationship with them through the email list without seeming like we're spamming them. I'm hoping to get some really good tips on that today. And then of course, Ashley Cook's gonna be bringing that to us who has 13 years of sales and marketing and analytics. Uh, in her pocket, as well as shifted later on into serving small business owners, which just like us developed copy for multi million dollar brands, social media influencers, and small business startups. She's a copywriter as well as a copy coach. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Ashley Cook. Thank you, Brett. Let me get my screen share up and we'll jump right in. I'll get the chat up as well. So if you have any questions as uh, we're going through this, definitely pop it into the chat. Um, I would love to know before we get going, how many in here do have uh, an active email list going for your business? If you can just drop I, yes or no in the chat, that'll give me kind of an idea. Um, and uh, active meaning that you are at, you are emailing them. Um, Sometimes we have lists and we just don't talk to our list. So, uh, but what, what I'm going to focus on uh, with this series is how you can start to build a high quality list from the beginning all the way to how do you start to uh, or continue to nurture those relationships. So, uh, we have some yeses and some nos in the chat. So, that's great. Uh, so, whether you're starting from scratch or you have one going, um, this, this series is designed to help give you uh, some ways that you can show up more powerfully through email and um, and start communicating with those those readers on your list. So that one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this particular webinar series is that uh, when it comes to email marketing, there is major untapped potential for growth in your business and it's sitting right in your inbox. Uh, so what we're gonna do for this three part is this first part, we're gonna set some foundations around email marketing, some foundations and best practices. Uh, the second part, is around how you can start actually building out your list with higher quality leads. What are some ways that you can um, that you can start letting people know you have a list, getting them on your list, and start, but not just getting any random person on your list, um, getting the right fits for your business on your list. And then the third part, I will actually dive into some more of the how tos on how to write those first initial emails that that will keep your open rates up uh, and your readers engaged. So. Uh, but first, we're going to lay some foundations and best practices, and uh, and then we'll just jump right in. So, let's see, we have a comment. I have a list, but not currently marketing to them via email. Okay, great. So you have a list. So um, that's awesome. So uh, we have kind of the full gamut here uh, tuning in today. All right. So today, from a foundations perspective, we're going to go into what is email marketing and why you need it for your business. Why it's really important to have that list that you're interacting with um, to help grow your business. I'll then share five different types of email marketing. There are more than five, but I'm picking, uh, I picked some of the, the more popular of those five uh, or more pop, the more popular five of those um, types. Anyways, we're also gonna go into key metrics to track and then uh, spend the last portion of our time together going into some best practices for writing emails and subject lines that are click worthy and really irresistible for your, uh, for your reader. So first, what is email marketing? Um, this may seem pretty simple, so bear with me. It won't take long. Um, basically, email marketing is a form of direct marketing. It's where you are sending a commercial message uh, using email to a potential or a current customer. So it may sound pretty simple. Okay, I send them emails about my business, but it's not necessarily so because not every email pushes a sale and not every email is going to knock it out of the park. So what do you do when that happens? Uh, so I'll, I'll start to break that down for you um, as we move through this. But first, why do you need email marketing in your business? So email has been around for a long time. Um, I think back to the good old, like, you've got mail days and how exciting it was to see that little, like, um, mailbox pop open. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I got an email. 
and it was really fun. Uh, email has continued to grow and evolve. We're getting more and more emails now than we ever have before. Uh, so when we think about um, email marketing from a business perspective, it's actually one of the most effective ways that you can market your business. So I have some stats here. There are a ton of them out there. I just pulled a few. Um, so 64%, so almost two out of three small businesses are using email marketing. So it is a popular form of marketing within business. Uh, almost 99%, so almost all of us are checking our emails every day, meaning that it's a very active, engaged place to be within the inbox. And then um, three out of four say that email is important to their company's success. So when we think, okay, well, why is it important to um, a business's success? And it has to do with the ROI. So the ROI or return on investment within email marketing is one of the highest ROIs across really any marketing spend out there. So there's a, it's a 4,200% ROI, which sounds like crazy high. <clears throat> so when you break it down into numbers, uh, it's basically saying that you earn $42 for every dollar spent. So it's an impressive ROI. It's a very effective tool to reach your clients and start to um, kind of mine that untapped potential within, um, within your network. So now we're going to go into um, some of the different types of email marketing that you can start to have within your business now that we know that it is actually a really important, effective, and profitable way to market um, what you do. So the first type has to do with a welcome email or welcome sequence. You can hear them call different name, names like that. Um, but, and essentially what welcome emails or welcome sequence are is uh, they are an initial set of a kickoff emails, if you will, that welcomes your subscriber to your list. So you have someone who goes and opts in, um, they, they submit their email address, they join your list somehow, and they receive a series of, they can be three to five, seven, some, some welcome sequences I've seen go up to 10 emails that um, kind of start off and build that relationship with your reader. So it can include details like, you know, introducing yourself, your company, what you're all about, how you serve, what are some of those uh, products, what are some of the reviews, uh, what people say you know, what you're all about. The goal of this welcome series is really to start building that rapport and, and shift from that, um, that cold lead into something that uh, more of an acquaintance, right? So whenever someone joins your list, you don't know, um, you don't necessarily know how much they know or don't know about you. So um, these welcome emails are really important introductory, an introductory period. Uh, so why is this important? Why, why do you not just shoot immediately to the sale? Uh, or promoting. Well, not everyone who joins your list is ready to buy. Even if they are like, let's say that you're an ideal client, perfect lead, you know they would be an amazing fit, but that does not mean that they're ready to buy. And I was doing some digging on this and I found some research that says that only about one in four of those who join your list are actually ready to purchase. So three out of four who hop on your list aren't quite ready to hand over the credit card to you yet. So if you think about it, uh, if they join your list, three out of four aren't ready to buy. Let's say you just immediately start going into the sale. That's like asking someone that you're on a first date with for their hand in marriage or someone who is a window shopper um, and taking them straight to the financing department. It's just jumping the gun. It's, it's doing something too soon. So these welcome emails uh, help to kind of go and uh, build that relationship and start to nurture that and uh, turn it from a complete stranger to someone who is familiar with you, your business, what you're all about. So um, they help to nurture and grow that relationship. So um, there is some strategy to building out the, that email, that welcome sequence to make it more successful. And that's really what we're gonna get into, into um, when we get to part three. So I have a checklist of those must have pieces that you wanna have included an email sequence and we'll walk through how you can start to write yours out in uh, some very easy steps and get that automated so that anyone who goes into your list or joins your list will automatically receive those before they ever start to get um, like all those, that promotional goodness that, that you wanna you wanna do. So um, the advantage of having a welcome email, and I'll just wrap this up before moving to the next one, and because I don't want to overlook this because it's actually really important, is that initial, those, and, um, the welcome emails, and especially that initial one, 
boasts the highest open rate that you may see for most of your emails. So um, they have the highest open rate, highest click through rate. So if someone joins your list and you don't have that uh, welcome email, it's a missed opportunity because they're waiting to get, they're, they're like the most eager and the most excited because they're like new to your list and curious of what you're going to send. So um, they, they really do help to create that strong, positive first impression. So that's largely why in part three, we're going to take some time and get that, um, get that crafted and, uh, and kind of lined out for you and your business. All right, newsletters. How many of y'all send newsletters or receive newsletters, love newsletters? What's your opinion on newsletters? I'm really curious on this one because it's really kind of split. Great to read if informative. That is such a good point, and I'm so glad you made that. Uh, so, email newsletters can be very can be great tools. They can be effective if um, or a great way to educate those who are on your list. Um, a great way to educate them about your business. Yeah, I just saw another. Depends on who it's from. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that that kind of makes. I, I hear the tentativeness in the comments of it's great to read if it's informative or depends on who it's from. So we're kind of a little leery about newsletters. Here's why they can, um, they can really be, you know, like to receive and read sometimes. 1 of the reasons why newsletters are a little, um, they can be hit or miss is because sometimes they get overstuffed. That's 1 of the risks with newsletters. So newsletters are those emails that get sent out where. We, you know, put all this information on the latest and greatest in our company. They can sell, um, they can inform. There's all there's different goals. Usually, there's multiple topics within a, a newsletter. You can, you can include information in your newsletter, like you know, showcasing your employees. Maybe you have a product announcement, or you're wanting feedback on something. Um, maybe you're notifying people of your latest podcast or YouTube video or blog. Um, they can be great ways to drive traffic to your website. Um, you might also want to highlight special projects or initiatives that you did. Like, let's say you were at a, like a networking event, or you were presenting, or you were at a community event, you were donating to a charity, um, you were, you and your team were running a 5k, you know, as a, as a business team, um, <clears throat> newsletters can be a really wonderful way to create that, that brand awareness and recognition, um, and also to help you stay top of mind with your list. Uh, the watch out and one of the way reasons why they are kind of tentatively received is uh, they can, I've seen them get really lengthy and uh, that is one risk or watch out with the newsletter um, is, is trying to overstuff it with too much information. And if that's the case, you can help to kind of alleviate that pressure by just breaking it up into two emails or to, uh, to two shorter newsletters and maybe increase your frequency a little. Um, cause you don't want all that good information that you have going on to get buried. Uh, another comment. I think they're great. I send out newsletters for a dog food company and include offers, best sellers, flash sales, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, 1 of the other tips that you can also do for newsletters is if you do have a lot of content to share, um, you know, like offers, best sellers, flash sales, et cetera. If you're including some multiple of those things in one email, just um, you can do some different visual design to help call out those different sections if you are trying to communicate quite a bit of content. But yeah, newsletters are great, especially if you're kind of scrolling through and you're seeing kind of the highlight snippets of it. Um, it just watch watch the length on um, if it's really super text heavy because then it kind of can start to become uh, like a mini novella and you may start to notice uh, your readers start to drop off. But newsletters can be wonderful. Um, Tools when used properly. All right, so the dedicated or standalone email. So this is a type of email. If let's say you're hosting a webinar or you are um, putting together an event that you want your readers to sign up for, um, you know, it it could be you're partnering with another business and you have an event coming up, um, or you have a, a you know a five day challenge on online, um, or maybe you have a retreat or something that you want to let your readers know about and uh, you want them to, to sign up. So you send out a standalone email. It's not part of a normal newsletter. It's not part of your welcome sequence. It's not, it's just kind of a standalone event. 
Um, you can do that also for flash sales as well. So the advantage of these dedicated or standalone emails uh, is that they have a focused call to action. So usually they have one purpose or one intent, and uh, that's why they get they can get such high results because these emails have that that singular focus and and singular goal. Unlike newsletters, which may have a lot of information and potential actions they can take, and so the reader has to kind of decide and pick and choose which one they want. These standalone ones are, hey, sign up for this webinar or book your retreat or catch this flash sale on this, you know, these Easter baskets or, or whatever it may be. Um, so that's another type of email marketing. Uh, then we get to nurture emails. So these are, these are so fun. And um, I love, I love nurture emails because of how personalized they can get. So usually nurture emails are ones that take your reader on a journey. And uh, the end result of that journey would be to impact their buying behavior somehow, right? So maybe it's, you know, through, through these series of emails, you're, you're taking them on a journey to, uh, with the end goal of signing up for a consultation or um, landscaping services or buying a gift, like a massage gift card or a yoga pass, or maybe you offer a course that only opens up three to four times a year and you have a series of emails that helps to promote whenever those open so that you can let them know um, that the course is open and it's time for them to buy. Uh, so the, the powerful thing about nurture emails is that they can move your reader from the, oh, this is nice kind of consideration stage to more of that decision stage. Um, but you're using different tactics and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you're using different tactics and techniques to take them on that journey. So it can be stories, it can be, testimonials, it can be um, case studies, it can be just you sharing you or talking about the benefits. Um, so these, you can have a lot of fun with the nurture emails. And the advantage of the nurture emails is that you can write those in advance. So let's say, let's say that you have someone who hops on your, your list and you have five welcome emails set up to, let's say they immediately sign on or join your list, they receive these five emails over a period of, you know, two to three weeks, however long you want to space them out. And, um, and then after that, they receive whatever regular communication that you happen to send out, whether it's your newsletters or your standalone emails. And then let's say you have a course that opens up and um, you have all those emails already typed and ready, locked and loaded. And uh, so you know that once they join the list after the, the welcome emails are done, maybe Two weeks after the e welcome emails are done, they, they then can get uh, kicked into the emails that promote your course. The powerful thing about that is that actually both of those, e your welcome emails and those the, that nurture sequence can all be automated. So um, as new leads come in, you can write and have those emails already scheduled out so that they're getting that. So it's potentially some high return for a pretty low effort because you have it already written and automated. Um, so think of it, I like to think of it as like the crockpot style of emailing where you can fix it and forget it. And the email automation like does all the work for you. So um, that's one, one uh, advantage of this nurture email. Yeah, so for example, nurturing your customer by knocking down their skepticism of your product or service by emotive storytelling. Yeah, that is another way that you, another um, technique whenever you're bringing in emails, especially if you have a launch or a, um, some type of, of service or product that you're wanting to uh, eventually lead them to buy. Uh, having that in your copy where you're knocking down and addressing those barriers uh, and obstacles is a really powerful way. You can do that through storytelling, um, through your own stories, through your client results stories, through testimonials, there are a number of ways. You can do it through FAQs. I've seen emails come through with, um, where they just kind of design it as, here's some common questions that we get and then boom, 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 you have say three or four questions in that email and uh, they're, they're direct obstacles or barriers that might keep them from otherwise purchasing. So yeah, that's a great, as a great example. All right. Re-engagement emails. This is another type of email that, um, that is nice to have. It's not necessarily a must have, but it's one if you wanna keep your list clean, that's an effective one to have. So this one is, um, have you ever not opened up an email uh, for, from a company for a while and then you get an email that says something like, 
hey, we miss you, or is it something we said, or we'd love to have you back. Um, I got this email from uh, last week, actually, <clears throat> from a company. Um, it was like a news company in uh, San Antonio, and I hadn't opened their emails in a while. And uh, I got this email like, you know, hey, we miss you. And I was like, that's a re-engagement email. Um, that is basically when uh, emails that are sent, and you can schedule these out too, where if you have a subscriber hop on your list, and after a while they haven't opened, they haven't opened your emails in a set period of time, and you can determine what that time is, um, they, they would then, um, if they haven't opened those emails, then <clears throat> they would get this re-engagement series where it could be, you know, it can be just a, a small handful of emails that um, helps to reestablish that connection and that goodwill with your subscriber uh, and gives them the opportunity to say, hey, no harm, no foul, no hard feelings. If you, you know, if this, if my emails no longer serve you, it's totally okay. You can unsubscribe or do nothing. And in a week, you know, I'll, I'll remove you from the list. And so that helps to keep your list clean because um, ultimately you do want to have an email list that is high quality, uh, highly engaged and, uh, and it's full of those those leads and sometimes people's needs change and it's natural there's nothing personal we unsubscribe you know you unsubscribe i unsubscribe from list uh, that we may have signed up for a while ago and just no longer is important in this season of life and that's okay so having those re-engagement emails can help to capture them if they're like oh i'm gonna like i still want to be on that list i just haven't opened them in a while um but ultimately it does these emails can help serve your audience better by um, giving those who aren't maybe the best fit a way out or just removing them from your list. <clears throat> so I mentioned there were some other types um, besides these five. And so we have like abandoned cart emails. There's, you know, review requests if you're wanting to get testimonials. So for that one, I'm so sorry. I keep having to clear my throat. Um, I think the storm that blew through kind of blew in allergies. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, Anyway, so on it's review happening to me too. I'm sorry. I keep turning my camera off so you guys don't see me like this. But yeah, I feel you. It's okay. You're doing great. Brett, it's terrible, isn't it? It's yeah. So if you see me like I just have a mute button here, and if I clear my throat, at least I'm in good company. Maybe Brett and I can sync up our our coughing. Um, okay, so review requests. Those are emails. So like, let's say you are a um, like a financial advising company. And a new client signs up to work with you and you've got all their stuff transferred over. Everything's going great. You can set up an automated email to go out like 6 months later to ask them for feedback or for a testimonial or review. Um, so that's another type of email. Those are actually really great because, uh, because you can use that in your future email marketing and it, when you automate it, it keeps it from having to, um, you from having to remember it's 1 less thing that you have to recall. So you can have that set up in your email marketing platform to go out automatically for new clients after a certain period of time. And then um, another type is transactional emails. And those are like your emails with order confirmations or receipts, thank you emails. Um, if someone bought a course from you, it's emails with login information, uh, things like that. All right, any questions so far before we go into key metrics? <clears throat> All right, I'll keep an eye on the chat in case any of those come in. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any at the moment. All right, then we will keep on hopping through to the key metrics that you should be tracking. So there are a number of, um, there are quite a bit of metrics that you can be looking at within your tool. Uh, I've chosen the most popular four. Um, some of them you may think are more important than others, and you may be surprised which ones are actually really important. Uh, so I've chosen four of them, and uh, let's just hop in to those. So the first one I want to talk about has to do with click-through rate. Your click-through rate uh, is the percentage of those who click a link or links within a given email. So this this uh, stat and or this metric and the other ones are found within when you log into your email marketing tool. Um, like MailChimp, for example, you can look and see all the different metrics for, for given emails um, that you send out. So click-through rate would be if you send out an email, it has a link in it, someone goes in and clicks it, that helps, that bumps up your click-through rate. Uh, if your click-through rate is low, uh, there's a couple of uh, things that you can do, as, uh, but I would primarily start with 
uh, making sure that your call to actions or that where your links are, it are clearly stated and easy to find. So have those be bolded. Um, you can put them as text in a different color. Uh, you can turn them into a button. Um, what about the direction we're getting warning about opening a link in emails like cybersecurity? So some of that has to do with knowing who your emails are coming from. So when you opt into a list, um, and you get emails from that list, like that, that's a different, I mean, if you get an email, like if your system is flagging that, that, um, that link, then I would pay attention to that. Um, but oftentimes the warning about links has to do with like phishing or, or, or scam, um, uh, email. So like, if you get an email from someone posing as your bank, uh, or posing as someone else. Uh, I would not click those links at all, but sometimes I've seen that where um, I, I opt in for, for an email um, to an email list and I get an email and sometimes I'll, I'll get that warning. Um, and sometimes what I do on that is I'll double check who the, who the sender is. And if it is from that, that business or group that I subscribe to, and then there's a way too that you can right click on that link and see what the address is and make sure that it matches up or it looks legit. So that's um, that's a good question, and it and it's never always super clear cut on when to click or not click. But I always kind of err on the side of caution. But when you do sign up for a legit email, um, and you are you sign up on a legit list, and you start receiving those emails, the links they send you um, from ethical sound companies should be okay for you to click. But sometimes your your email can um, your email provider can. Uh, send out kind of a warning flare, like, hey, we're not quite sure I've had that happen before. And it's like, okay, well, I'll just move on. So that, that could be one thing that you could look at as well from a diagnostic standpoint. I would say that's probably a little bit of a, maybe a, a lower risk, but um, from if you're the one sending out the email and no one's clicking, uh, but that's that's one that you could look, a potential cause you could look at for uh, low click-through rates. <clears throat> All right, open rate. So open rates are the percentage of those who will open your email. So um, we often look at this one uh, as we think like, oh, my emails should be, I see, I see this a lot, um, especially with those who are early on and newer into email marketing, like I should have like 70 or 80% of people opening my, my emails. Why do I only have like 20 or 25? And it's, it's so interesting because uh, different industries have different open rate averages. And I'll get to that here in a minute. But open rate is one um, that helps to determine who the amount of people on your list who are opening up your email. So if you're noticing that your ear open rate is low, check. Um, I would start with checking how your email appears in their inbox. So there are three levers that you can pull to kind of um, to adjust how your email shows up in their inbox. So one is to check your sender name. So how um, like the from uh, section on the the email. If you have something like no reply, like that's not going to be as effective as like having your name, because um, they're going to think like okay, maybe it's from a company or an automatic email. They may not even remember or know who no reply is. Um, so I would recommend from your sender name either doing your name or your name with uh, your business in it, um, and you can do some testing too on that to see who you know what your what open rates respond the best if it's your name or your business name. But I would make sure to have something that's personal and um, and not just like a generic, you know, info at businessname.com. Another another lever that you can pull uh, is around your subject line. So I'll share some tips a little bit later on on how to optimize your subject line. Um, but that's another major way that you can uh, entice people to open up your emails is by getting that part optimized. And then the third part is the preview text. So when you go into your inbox and you see like who the email is from, who the sender name is, uh, and then you'll see like some text in a lighter, like a lighter gray kind of beside it, that's a preview text and that can be uh, if you don't have anything, if you don't intentionally change that, um, like Google, for example, or Gmail will pull in the 1st few words of your, your email, but some, um, some. You know, are different. I've seen a lot of business owners who will go in and actually adjust that preview text to. 
to where it won't be that intro because maybe the the first few words aren't like particularly attention grabbing so they want something that's a little bit more eye catching so they'll go in and adjust that that preview text instead of uh, it being the first few uh, words snippet so um tailoring that is another way to get your your emails to stand out more in their inbox all right bounce rate so bounce rate is <clears throat> The percentage of total emails that you send out um, that could not be successfully delivered to your recipient. So there are two main types uh, of bounce rates that exist. There's the hard bounce and the soft bounce. Now the hard bounce happens when you're, you're you send an email to an email address that's either closed, it's invalid, like a typo, or non-existent. Um, this means if you have a hard bounce, that means that your email is never going to get delivered to that person because the email address is either non-existent or it's invalid or somehow shut down. Uh, so when you see the hard bounces, um, when you see that metric come through, remove those off your list as soon as you see them. Keep your list clean. Uh, make sure you know that 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 those get removed off of your list. Now on the opposite end is a soft bounce. So a soft bounce happens. When you have a temporary problem with a legit email. So say someone goes and signs up on your list, they type their name, their email address in, every it's it's a legit email, and uh, all of a sudden you get a bounce back and maybe their inbox is full, or maybe they're having their servers having an issue. That's a soft bounce. And that that sometimes like while the issue is resolving, the email system may try to send your, your email again. So there's still a chance of that one getting through. Um, so I would keep an eye on, for sure, on your hard bounces, um, but then also, you know, soft bounces aren't as severe, but they're still kind of important to look at. All right. The last uh, metric I want to talk through is unsubscribe rate. So the unsubscribe rate is, as you can probably guess, those who take themselves off of your list after opening an email. Now, the problem or the challenge with open rates and unsubscribe rates is that those two rates in and of themselves are, are they're, they're kind of, if you're looking at trying to figure out the health of your email list, those two rates are a little bit, they make it challenging to really actually see the, the health. They're not true indicators. Um, so, and I say that because um, many who get tired of reading emails may just stop opening them. They may not open up and go in and unsubscribe. Um, and so maybe they, you know, flag them as spam, or they just hit delete, or uh, they don't let them, they don't let them go. So, or they they just let them go without actually removing themselves off the list. So that it's it's really difficult to assess your email list health with those metrics. But ones like conversion, uh, not conversion, um, click through rate, those are uh, that's a more helpful metric for for you to look at for your email health. Um, but what's important is when you think about okay, well, all these rates are really are really Nice to know, but what do I do with them? How do I know if I have a good open rate or, you know, a, like a poor click through rate. Uh, and that really has to do with knowing your, um, knowing your industry and knowing what the standards are. So I wanted to do is show you, uh, I have 2, um, examples of, of benchmarks that you can look at. So you can find your industry and see what those averages are. Uh, I have Campaign Monitor and uh, in MailChimp. So, um, and I'll drop this into the chat if you want to see this one. And I'll do MailChimp in a minute. Um, but what you'll see is different industries have different uh, open rate benchmarks, click through rates. So that's where they're clicking your link, and then uh, they have click to open and unsubscribe rates. So if you look at um, like nonprofit, for example, is has a twenty almost twenty seven percent open rate, but then uh, if you look down at wellness and fitness, that's a little bit lower at nineteen percent. So um, that's why it's important to know your benchmarks because um, if you are in uh, the nonprofit world, your open rate standard your open rate standard is going to be uh, at a higher level than if you were in restaurant the restaurant or F and B um, industry. So you know if you're that, like it gives you a better gauge or a more accurate gauge on how your emails are performing against uh, the industry average. Um, MailChimp has another, they have one as well. I'll put that in the chat. So this one is helpful because it goes into your average open rate click rate, but it actually goes into your 
um, your bounce rates and your unsubscribe rates. Now, I would argue that a hard bounce, like you don't want to have any hard bounces. You want to keep that clean. Um, but they did bring that that end that um, those industry averages there as well. But you can scroll down and find your, um, you know, if you're into e-commerce, here's kind of what you, you're at a 16% average open rate. So those are helpful to know where uh, where you stand and if if your your metrics are performing uh, underperforming overperforming and what levers you can pull to get those those numbers up higher um, or in some cases lower like unsubscribe so uh, and if you're not sure about how your emails are performing or if you find that you're having another pressing business need uh, one of, I wanted to remind y'all about the resources that the North Central Texas SBDC offers um, they offer no cost confidential advising. They have trainings and resources um, that help you to really connect to the solutions for whatever challenge it is that you're facing. So uh, they're an amazing group of people who are connected to to incredible tools that can really help you overcome your challenges. So uh, visit the website or the the phone number. Both are on the screen, and um, they can get you get you uh, connected into where you where you want to go within your business. So. All right, so um, now we've kind of talked through the different types of email marketing and uh, some of those key metrics to keep an eye on as you do send your emails. Um, now, when it comes to writing uh, your emails, what are some of those best practices that um, you can have as you start to put you know, your, your pen to paper or your finger to the keyboard um, when you're typing? So the first has to do with don't email for the sake of sending an email. So um, People on average are receiving over 120 business emails a day and uh, competition is getting stiffer for in the inbox, but that doesn't mean that you should just send three emails a day or email, you know, just, just send for the sake of sending. Uh, and uh, when you send an email, you want to make sure that your reader wants to open it. And so if you're flooding them with, with all these emails, um, they could, they could get turned off by it. Depend if you're just emailing without purpose or without, you just, just to stay at the top of their inbox, that could actually turn them off. So send an email when you have something you want to say, uh, and that helps your readers to know that when they receive something from you, it's, it's really important and they should go in and click on it. All right, super helpful. Thanks for sharing the link. You're welcome. Yeah, it's really helpful to know where you're, like to just to compare, um, I'm a big fan of having numbers and metrics and knowing, you know, because like just a number in isolation never is never really helpful. Like is 20% good, is 80% bad. Um, so yeah, those are those are helpful and those uh, averages do get updated. So uh, it's helpful to know as the email marketing dynamics change and evolve uh, how those numbers change as well. Okay, so don't send for the sake of sending. Next is around optimizing your subject line. So I'll get into that uh, more in this in the next section. But um, this is really around having that eye grabbing, catching catchy subject line. Um, that is part of the copy that you write. And um, I know in past webinars we've talked about the importance of spending some time on your headline. And the email version of a headline is the subject line. Um, so know if people aren't interested or enticed to read your email or to uh, by your subject line, they're not going to click open and read your email. So make sure that um, you have that optimized subject line so that their their interest gets peaked and they want to click in and see what you got going on. All right, personalize your emails. So there's a couple different ways that you can personalize your emails. Um, you can use their name. So uh, you can have their name in their subject line, like their first name in their subject line. You can kick off your email with it. Um, you can use it within the copy. Um, so like if you're you know, starting to wrap up the email or you're about to really uh, describe it like, like, or share an important point, you can say, you know, Brett, I couldn't believe when whatever, whatever, or Brett, I want you to know this is really important. Uh, and then and share that because like there's something really powerful in the person's name and using that name it for the wandering mind it draws their attention back to what it is that um, that you're trying to share. So don't be afraid to use their name. You can use it in the subject line, kick off your email in the copy. You can use it in the PS statement at the bottom. There's a number of ways to do that. Uh, there's another way that you can personalize, and it has to do with segmenting your list. So. Um, 
And that has to do once you segment your list, you can personalize your emails based on the actions that the individuals on your list have taken. So what does that mean? Um, if we take the financial planner as an example, so let's say you have, you are a, a financial planner and you help, um, you know, whether it's young adults or those preparing for retirement, you kind of provide the full, the full serve, like a, the full age spectrum of uh, financial planning services. So you have a, a growing email list and you want to send some, um, some more tailored personalized emails. So you could break your list uh, out based upon, let's say the life stage. So you can apply tags that show if the person is near retirement, if they're an entrepreneur versus an employee, um, if they have kids, if they're a young adult, you can, you can put, you can, there's different ways to break out your list. So when you're sending emails, you're sending relevant personalized content to that particular subgroup on your list. So example, a fresh college graduate may not need to see, you know, your in-depth case study on preparing for retirement. Um, but if they're tagged, then they can start getting that information on what it's like the, on the importance of, you know, investing into your 401k or IRA uh, from the get go and why that matters when you're early on in your career. So you can start to, to tailor information based upon how you segment out your list. Um, but the more personalized you can get, the better. That may feel like a really advanced step to do uh, it, but some of these email marketing tools can make it easy, easier for you to segment out your list. Um, and so that's, it's, it can sound scary, but, um, if you can start very simple with uh, with how you start to break out your list and help to make it a little bit more manageable. All right, this next one is tough, especially if you're writing a newsletter and has to do with staying focused. So uh, we talked about that earlier with the risk of, and I've seen this not even just with newsletters, with other, um, with just, just straight up email, like standard email where you're writing paragraphs. Um, the There's always that balance of providing with providing just the information about right amount of information that you need on the topic that you're writing about um, and not overpacking. Like it's easy because you have you're a wealth of information. Like you're an expert in what you do. And you have this whole universe full of information and your ideal client has a very limited amount. And you're like, I have so much to tell them. And but they can't learn it all at once, right? So um when you do write your emails, it's okay to write short ones. It's okay to to be very focused. It's okay to write on one thing and and know that it's actually better if you write on one thing because then because of how much you do know you have you have like resources for a long time to keep to write emails and never to never run dry because um if you the more focused your emails are you can you can save these other topics for future emails so don't overpack um if you do have multiple topics kind of like what you would see in a newsletter, consider bullet pointing them or using uh, a visual design um, to make it easy for people to see the different sections and different topics that you have going on. So it's, that's really all around making it easy for your, your reader to, to read and enjoy the copy that you're sending. All right, next is around keep it concise. This one is another tough one and it's kind of connected into um, the focus, being focused. So when you're when you're drafting for your first draft, it's okay to, to just let the rambles ramble and it's okay to be verbose it's okay to to go on and on and on um but when you get to the editing round you take the writer's hat off you put the editor hat on this is when it's time to get ruthless uh so the three questions that i ask myself when i write copy are uh what is redundant or repetitive what if i said what phrases or um words have i have i used repeatedly like i've just i've used the same words over and over um, or what concepts have i explained multiple times that i can probably cut out some of that um, so what's redundant or repetitive and remove it unless it's there intentionally uh, and with a specific purpose uh, what is irrelevant so uh, what doesn't prove your point and what is uh what's text that the reader wouldn't care about if you were to remove this sentence would your point still be made um and if in where that answer is yes, go ahead and take that that out. Um, one tip that you can do, so I know like deleting can feel really scary. Uh, it feels so permanent to just like hit that backspace button. What you can do if you're writing in Google Docs, um, I've done this a number of times, and it, it for some there's something psychological that happens when you do it that just makes you feel so much more relieved. But just take that text that you're nervous about deleting, copy it, 
and then just add it as a comment on the side uh, of your, your Google Doc. And that way the comment will stay there, but it's out of your actual copy. And um, it's kind of like the closest thing I can think of is if you are like decluttering your closet and you don't want to get rid of that sweater yet, but you know you don't wear it. So you put it in a box and you just kind of set it in your garage and you're like, okay, if I don't think about this sweater for the next however, I don't know, month or so, I can donate it and I'm fine. It's kind of that stair step. Chances are if you donate the sweater. This is like that where you're trying to declutter your copy. You can just stick it as a comment on the side and um, and it helps you kind of stair step your way through to getting more comfortable with deleting content out of what you're writing. Uh, and then that brings me to the third point of how can I make this point in fewer words? I realized the irony because that last example with the closet uh, was a lot of words. So could I make that point a previous point in fewer words? Sure, I could cut out that the closet example, um, but I bet you have a good visual view of the closet now. So uh, if you can make your point in fewer words, do that. So if you're looking at a sentence and you're like, man, that's really like, that's a lot. Or if you um, read it, read your sentence out loud and it feels way more, like way longer or not like how you would talk normally, um, ask yourself, okay, how could I actually shorten this? How could I make this snappier? Um, and then those are ways that to help you kind of get, cut out that fluff or trim the fat, so to speak, on your copy. All right, next, uh, make sure that your copy is easy to digest, that's quick to skim. Uh, make sure that your paragraphs are short, you're not getting super jargony, um, you're using bold, you know, like uh, uh, sporadically using bold text or bullet points. 46% um, of emails are opened on mobile devices, so that's almost half. So when your emails appear differently on a phone than they do on your desktop, so making sure that your paragraphs are short and those bullet points help to make your copy a lot more readable on the mobile device. So we're, you're having to write for, for two different reader experiences whenever you're writing your, your newsletters or your emails. All right, balance how much you sell. So this is all around the balance of when do I like promote? When do I not promote? What is that magic answer? What is that magic kind of in between? Um, we had a comment. I made that mistake too many times. Yeah, that is one that um, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the paragraph, like not optimizing for mobile or desktop. That is one that um, that it's it's easy to not catch and you can uh, that that's we're constantly challenged to improve on that over time. I myself have gone through that as well. And um, fortunately, there are tools online you can look at to see how your copy looks on different devices. So. Um, but yeah, that's one that it's a common one and, uh, we're always having the opportunity to get better at it. All right. So back to balancing the whole value versus like, when do I sell? When do I not sell? Or when do I promote? When do I not promote? Now, some of this is going to depend on your industry, um, and your audience. And, but there's one caution to keep in mind when you're thinking of, when do I promote? When do I not promote? <clears throat> Excuse me. And it has to do with offer fatigue. Now, offer fatigue is when you promote so much that your offer actually starts to lose value. And when your offer starts to lose its value, your readers start to check out and they start to see your emails and think, okay, well, she's going to promote again. He's going to try to sell me some more. I'm just not even going to bother. So what I recommend as a starting point is, um, and this is a common recommendation, it's not just my opinion, um, is the 80-20 rule. So that's, you know, sending um, one promotional email for every five. So um, that is a, that's a helpful starting point so where you're not feeling salesy uh, all the time, but you're still able to, to send a direct promotion or a direct invitation for someone to, um, to work with you or use your services. Uh, now, again, this does depend on your industry. If you're, if you're, a pizza company or like a, like a pizza restaurant, or I'm thinking more of like, if you're in the food industry, that that's, that statistics probably going to change some. Um, but if you're in the service industry, if you offer a program, um, or like financial services or and even like roofing, uh, for example, like that, it's helpful to, to, to not have every email to be a promotion. You don't that have every email, not be a promotional email. And so when you're thinking about, okay, what do I send? Uh, on those emails that aren't promotional. Like I know how to promote my stuff, but what do I send instead of it? Well, you can still actually promote your business without 
uh, and talk about your business or or how what you do helps the lives of you know of your ideal client without doing the hard promote. So you can you can share about um, we talked some about it earlier. Um, where you can share your business news, you can share product updates. Maybe you've revamped something and you're really excited about it. Uh, events that you're hosting, if you have a webinar that's coming up um, or that challenge, uh, some projects that you're a part of, you can do employee spotlights, you can share client testimonials um, or celebrations. Like let's say you have a client that got, like if you're into CrossFit uh, or if you own a CrossFit company and you have this um, client who that you're just, you're so proud of and they had this amazing accomplishment and you're like, I really want to spotlight them. That's a great way to just to just share that with your community. Um, you can share stories like, why did you get into doing what you're doing? Why, why do you care about roofing? Why do you care about, about having financial security? Why is that important for you personally? So there's, there's tons of ways that you can share uh, and build that relationship without doing the direct sell. Um, so I would recommend starting off with one promotional email for every five, play around with that and, and see the, the caveat to that or the exception I would give on that one is if you are leading up to a launch. So let's say you are, let's say that you're a business coach and you have um, a coaching container, like a four month coaching container that opens up three times a year and leading up to that start date, like the eight, the six weeks leading up to that start date is your recruitment period. Now that that zone, that six week zone of where you're trying to fill the seats in your coaching program is gonna be with, you're gonna have more, um, more frequent uh, promotional content leading up to that. So that's a different strategy. But in general, if you're just talking like throughout the normal year, uh, try that one in five. All right, uh, we talked about this before, keep an eye on your metrics. So. Uh, as you continue to experiment with email marketing, and, I, and marketing is is always an experiment, experiment um, these metrics are going to be your guide, and they're going to help you to assess the level of your, your um, email marketing health uh, and help you to know, to run diagnostics on where you can improve and how you can start to email um, more efficiently and start getting more results. So those, those numbers can be your North Star with that. And because marketing is an experiment, uh, test, test, test. So uh, a, a number. So I, I, all the main email marketing platforms that I'm aware of have the offer the ability to test. Like um, they call it like A/B split testing. So that's where you can test, um, for example, like two different subject lines for the same email. So the copy of your email and those two emails are going to be the same, but you just change up the subject line to see uh, which group is going to open up the email more like than the other. Uh, which which subject line wins out. Uh, you can also test out different designs to see what may appeal more to your list. If you're trying to, um, you know, that could be another way if you're trying to change up your newsletters, for example, or um, if you're wanting to test like a plain email with just text and your name at the bottom, like your email signature at the bottom versus like a branded template look, um, you can A-B test that. You can also test Short form, short form versus long form copy. So let's say that you you've just published out a blog, and um, you have copy that just gives like a two or three sentence, like "Hey, go check this out." Like, here's what it's about. Here's the link. Versus a longer form that may go into more of the benefits or tease out a story. You can test long form versus short form. Um, you can also test how your sender name appears. So you can send the same exact email, same exact subject line and change, uh, like have it be from your uh, a personal name versus your company name and see which performs better. Uh, how many call to actions you have in an email? Maybe you have one uh, email that has just one button at the bottom. Maybe you have one that has a button with some text kind of inter or, or hyperlink text interspersed. Uh, you can test the time of the day, day of the week. There's so many options on what you can test. So if you're unsure, if you ever catch yourself thinking, I wonder how this would do if I did this, that's a great indicator of you can probably test that and, um, and you can test that with your next email. So uh, if you ever have that, those curiosity moments, turn it into a test and see what you can do. All right, 
So those are some of the best practices. There are a bunch of other ones. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm saving some for part three. Uh, specifically, I know it, some of you may have questions around like spam, like what are some of those words to avoid and all. I'm saving that for part three. Um, so those are just some of the top uh, best practices for writing emails that I recommend. Uh, now we're going to change into our transition into the writing subject lines and uh, how can you start to write more irresistible subject lines that your readers just just can't get their mouse or their finger to fast enough to click um, subject lines are what helps to get your emails opened so um, it's important to spend some time on those and to start um, kind of upping your game or, or experimenting trying new things with that so uh, my first tip here is around having a working title so or working subject line um, so before you write the body of your email, I recommend having just a, a, a working subject line. It doesn't have to be a super stellar. It doesn't have to be overly creative, um, but just something that is going to capture what your email is about. That will help you to stay focused and that, that working title will, will function as kind of the North Star for you as you write your email. Uh, it kind of helps to set the direction and keep you from kind of winding and weaving all over the place. Next is uh, keep your subject line short. So um, what happens if your subject line is too long is that it falls off the preview screen. Now, if you're on a desktop, you got some long runway because you have a whole monitor that it could fill up. But if you're on your phone and 46% of emails that get opened are on the phone, your preview screen is pretty darn short. So um, in terms of how long or how short, it, it vary, the recommendation varies. I've seen some... Um, some email marketers say to keep it less than nine words or 60 characters. I've seen others say seven words and 20 characters. Um, but what you can do, and I'll show you, uh, I've, we've talked about this tool before, but I'll show you at the end a way that you can actually see how your, um, your, your email subject line will show up as a preview. Uh, and you, I think you, you may be able to do that on some email marketing platforms too, just to see how your, your email will show up in their inbox as a preview before you hit, before you send it out. But the, the, Main point here is keep it short. All right, um, because of that, because you do have a limit, uh, your a limitation on uh, how many words and characters can fit on a screen, shift the most important words to the front or to the beginning of your subject line. Uh, that'll help it to be more visual. Plus, as readers, we catch the bookends. We catch the first and the last few letters. And then that middle can sometimes be, our brain kind of fills in the blank uh, or fills in that middle. Also, um, start to uh, like start your subject line with more action verbs. This gets the reader more uh, flips them into an engaged uh, mindset when they're reading, and uh, helps your your subject line to come across as stronger and more confident. All right, keep it clear and keep it focused. So, um, when you're writing your subject line, make sure that it's it clearly is relevant and related to the copy that is in the body. Uh, otherwise, it becomes clickbait, which is really just, oh, I want to create the most enticing headline, and then you click it, and, or subject line, and you click it, and then the inside has nothing to do with it. Um, that can destroy trust between you and your reader, so make sure that your subject line uh, is related. It's simple. It's related uh, to the copy. It's um, focused and clear on, um, on that goal that it is you want to achieve. All right. This might be a gross picture for some, but others, you may love spam. Um, the only kind of spam that we universally do not like is when uh, your email gets flagged as spam in an inbox. So um, this has to do, when you think about spam words, I'll go into more detail on this in part three, but um, spam words can trigger, if you have them in your subject line or in your email, it can trick the, or trip the trigger on the email marketing platforms to send your email to the spam folder, never to be seen by eyeballs again. So when you think about spam words, uh, you're you're wanting to avoid language that sounds like it's creating unnecessary urgency, um, over exaggeration, anything that may feel like shady or unethical. So this can differ by platform, like different platforms may have some variation in what they consider to be spam words. Um, but I'll give you some more examples on that in part three, um, because they're you know, when I was doing research on it, it was like there's the list continues to evolve and the list can feel really overwhelmingly long. So, um, you know, because it could flag words like 
free gift or, you know, lowest price or risk free. Like some of those can feel very like overly salesy or, or spammy for lack of a better word. So that can, those can be triggers too. Um, but we'll get into more of that in part three. All right, try out different techniques. This has to do with different psychological techniques that helps to, um, to get folks to open up your, your emails. So think about um, like curiosity or mystery. So when um, the brain is a fascinating, fascinating thing to study, uh, we as humans don't like to have, we wanna have closure. And uh, when, you, when you create or stoke curiosity or mystery, um, that creates an open loop in your mind and your brain wants to find closure in it. Uh, so one example is you're watching a movie, you know you need to run a bunch of errands, but uh, you wait till the end of the movie before you go and run the errands because you want to see, you want to know that the movie, like the story, how the story gets resolved out, or you wait to the end of a chapter of a book before you go and unload the dishwasher. Um, those are just some everyday examples of how you can do that. Um, you can also create urgency. Uh, within your headline, just to apply some levers on, you know, the, the, noting that they're about to lose something, if that's true, um, or, you know, time is running out, um, you can create that, that you can use that as a, as an element to get them to open up, just letting them know they're going to miss out on something, um, as long as that is true. You can also personalize it because, you know, as we mentioned before, we love our names. Um, you can also tee up a cool story. So, for example, let's say that you're sharing about a client experience in your email and there was this like really cool quote and you could have that subject line be that really cool quote. Or maybe there's an obscure part of the story that um, doesn't seem like it would connect, but uh, like it was. So I was I wrote an email for a client a couple months ago that um, they're a publicist and um, the email had to do with Ruby Red uh, or the email subject line was something like something with like ruby red slippers and it may not seem unrelated it created curiosity for people to open up um but when they open it up they see the story about how she got into public uh, becoming a publicity agent and um and how it started with her as a little girl watching uh the wizard of oz on tv and uh she loved those ruby red slippers and so it's but we use that as the hook on the subject line uh, and that email was one of her higher open rates just because it wasn't like a normal standard subject line that you see pop up in your uh, your inbox. So you can tee up a really fun personal story um, with that uh, using that technique. Uh, you can also pose a question. So uh, when uh, when we uh, when we're asked questions, our brains can't help but answer it. So it's a fun way to get people engaged right off the bat by asking them a question in the subject line. Um, you can also play with emojis. That's another. It's not like a deep psychological technique, but um, if you look through your inbox, probably not a lot of your emails have emojis or your subject lines have emojis in them. Um, so including one in your subject line could help make it pop a little bit more uh, compared to some of those other emails. But again, that depends on your brand and, um, you know, how you want to come across as well. All right, look at what works. So one of the things about subject lines is there are tons of resources out there that um, that showcase what a successful email subject line can look like. They provide examples or templates so that you don't have to kind of start from scratch. So um, these are ones that are tried and true. They're tested. They can go into why they work. Uh, I was looking at one before um, we hopped on. Let me see if I can. Let's see if I can get it pulled up here. The bar at the top is covering it. So, oh, here we go. Okay, so this one is from Optin Monster, but this is just an example. If you're looking at um, going to a credible um, email marketing um, source, but this one has 164 best subject lines to boost your email open rates, which is like an obscene amount of subject lines, but they can be used to, you can use them to, um, to get ideas and so that you're not having to start from scratch. So I'm showing this for illustrative purposes. Um, so this, this particular uh, article has uh, 10 different types of subject lines that you can, um, that you can go and look at. And so let's just click fear of missing out or FOMO. So it goes into the psychological um, element behind it, like why it works. And then they give you some real life examples of, um, of where companies have used that fear of missing out uh, technique to to create subject lines. So you see examples of 
like, uh oh, your prescription's expiring. Um, I had that happen with CVS. They were texting me. They're like, your prescription's not going to get filled if you don't do this. And it was like a very real, like, oh, I need to go jump on this. It, they created that urgency for me and I responded. Uh, and it's all true. Um, you know, you have like earn double points today only. Like all of these, there's definitely like the unethical way that you can go about using like FOMO uh, or fear of missing out. But in these cases, in these examples, it's all it's all true. It's all real. You and you're coming at it from a place of you don't want your reader to miss out on this opportunity because it's actually a really great opportunity. It's actually it's a great opportunity to earn double points. It's a really important that you get your prescription filled uh, before it expires. Um, you know, you have one day to watch whatever digital marketer was putting out that day. Um, so those are just some examples of how those are being used. You can go down and look at, you know, curiosity. We talked about that, um, like how that to create that that open loop within the brain. Um, so so that's one way that you can look at some templates just to give yourself uh, a starting point that can help to because it can be really intimidating to sit at a blank screen and think like, like to have that cursor just staring at you and blinking at you so harshly. And it's like, how do I create a subject line? Um, so looking at ones that are tried and true have already been tested is a great starting point. Uh, and I've shared this tool before, but it's it's worth repeating. Um, you can also go and run through, if you're not quite sure if your subject line uh, is strong or not, you can run it through co-schedules, email, subject line tester. I'll drop the link here in the chat for that. And that's essentially where like, let's just do how you can stop heartburn naturally. And it um, shows you your subject line. You want to you want a score that gets you in the green. So it's at 60 is the green mark. So uh, really close on that one. But it'll flag the words that increase open. So you'll see that in green, uh, like with you can. And then words that could decrease open, words like stop. So you can then go through, see what your email subject line is uh, rated as and then look at kind of their diagnostic tools underneath to see how you can optimize it. Uh, what I love about this tool is that um, under the words that increase opens and words that decrease opens, they have word banks underneath. So you can click, like if I wanna bump my rating or my score, I can go into words that increase opens and look through and see if there's any words from here or if there are any words from here that, um, that, I, could, uh, that I could include. And then you could also hit this download button and have that as a, an, a handy download while you're creating them before you run them through the optimizer. It does it also for words that uh, that could decrease opens. It also does your word count and your character count for you. So if you're wanting to keep it short, um, emojis, it talks about emojis. Here's the preview. So here's where you can uh, see the preview in different um how your subject line will appear in different inbox styles. So this looks more like a Google, this one up here. This one looks more like an Outlook. And then this one is like your, your mobile phone. Um, so you can see where the words cut off, like how you can stop Harper naturally. Well, that naturally gets cut off um, on the, the mobile device one. So that is a helpful tool to, to get you pointed in the right direction. But again, I definitely recommend you can test out different subject lines and see uh, they can be really fun to write and to run through that tool or to uh, look through the templates and see how you can apply them to um, what it is that uh, uh, what it is you're writing about and sending out. So um, so that wraps up this first part of foundations and uh, some of those best practices on writing emails and subject lines and key metrics. The next time we're going to focus exclusively in on this one powerful way that you can build your email list, um, but not just build it with any, I mean, you can, you can always build a list of just of massive numbers, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be high quality leads and, um, and potential customers for your business. So we're going to go into specifically how you can start attracting in um, those quality leads, better fits for your business so that when you do email them, you can start to bump up your um, your conversion rates and and grow your business. So I'm really excited about this next uh, the second part. It's it's so fun and um, and it's one that can that can get you results. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, definitely feel free to reach out and connect with me and uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions or um, whatever comes up. Thank, thank you, Ashley. And uh, just to remind everybody, she put three very valuable links 
in the chat today. So please make sure I'm going to try to give you guys time to go ahead and copy those and paste them into notes for yourself on your own computer. Uh, and while we're at it, I'd like to go ahead and add one to it, which will help those of you who missed any of the other wonderful things that Ashley has done. This is our YouTube channel at the North Central Texas Small Business Development Center YouTube channel. And it has uh, all of the past training courses and classes on many different topics and subjects such as this. And we have a lot of things that have been uh, put out by Ashley. So if you feel like you've missed out and you still want more, go there and don't forget part two coming up for this for her. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and drop them in the chat box. Or for those of you who are a little bit more inclined to say, I want to talk, go ahead and unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll be happy to unmute you. And you can ask a question to uh, Ashley directly. And silence. Oh, I did get, hold on one second. Let me okay. redrop the links from. For Thank you for that, Naomi. Chat. I'm going to drop in. Um, there's the three links again, if y'all need them. Great. Okay. Any questions? Anything that pops up? That could also be around any fears or uncertainties that you have around sending emails. Um, if you know, I can also talk to some of those too. If you're like, oh, I'm not so sure I want to send an email or I don't right. really know what I'm going to email about. You can drop those in uh, the chat as well and I can talk to those. Right. And uh, well, while, while people are dropping a few more comments in there and everything, I do have a comment and kind of a question that you spurred for me when it comes to, uh, the closet, by the way, I did that over the spring break personally. And so I totally get it. And it's weird because you find all these things that you never knew, you know, that you were doing, but that's not the point. The point is that the closet is really full when you're writing an email or you're trying to uh, inform somebody about something that you think is important for them to know and hope that they will engage with you in some level of capacity that inqu inquires about your services at the very least, right? So I really appreciate what you're saying about cleaning out the closet as you're going and saying, okay, let's just put that over here. And if I don't really need it, don't put it in. Um, being concise for me personally is extremely important because I consider myself busier than normal. And I know that many people in, the, in, in our industries uh, do, especially if they're other business owners. And so what they're gonna do is uh, delete it if it's too long. So. I appreciate the conciseness. Is there a way that we can package that up like what you were saying with the heading of the, the line and stick to that subject and then give them maybe a way to go back to your website to get more information about it? Would that be the way to do it? Or I mean, because if, if there is too much information, the clause is full. Yeah. If the closet's full, what do you do? Um, it's a great question. So there's a couple ways that you can go about that. So if you have a lot of content and you know it's going to be too much in an email, that might be one where you have a blog on your website or a section where you can put those resources and then send them that shorter recap email of what are the key takeaways or a teaser email um, and then drive them to your website and where they can read the fuller amount. Like Which a you blog can also even? Yeah, like a blog. If you have it posted on your website as a blog, like a longer, you could write that longer piece. And if you're like, oh, that was going to be an email, but this kind of went into the blog realm. Um, you could put it on your website and then have them and write a shorter email that that gets them over there. Okay. Um, you could also break that email. So let's say you're writing something and it has a couple, like you're wanting to make a couple, like two or three points in that longer email. You could actually break that up into two, into two or three shorter emails and just tee it up like on the front end of your email and say, you know, I'm trying to give an example. Um, like three step, I'm thinking like, uh, okay, like the float spot, uh, like um, where you go and you you float in the Epsom salts. There's a place in Denton that, or Frisco, there's a place south of me that does that and it's wonderful and there's so many benefits. So if you were like writing an email about the benefits of floating in Epsom salt, um, and let's say there's like three or four main ones, you could tee up an email that says, you know, like over the next couple, you know, over the next three emails, I'm going to share with you like three amazing, like three powerful ways or three amazing ways that that floating can benefit or give you more energy or whatever. And then you share the first one, 
and then you end your email saying, stay tuned in a couple of days because I'm going to share the second one. Then in the second email, you say, hey, in my last email, I talked about how, you know, Epsom salt can really help you sleep well. In this email, I'm going to focus on blah, 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 blah. So you're linking the three emails, but you broke it out that that longer content into something more digestible. Great information. Thank you. And I believe Lynn has a question. She was hoping to ask you as well. Thank you for that answer. Sure. Lynn, would you like to go ahead and unmute and ask your question to Ashley? Can you hear me? Now yes. we can. Sure. Okay, okay good. Um, so I send out, create and send out a weekly email to a list of um, potential buyers for land, real estate rural properties and it's basically just about the properties it's not there's no other value i guess or trying to get them into a funnel it's showing them we already know that they're interested they're a hot prospect we know they're interested in in purchasing property um in this area. So I I just, you know, I always I hear these the the email webinars are presenting the same thing where they're trying to get people into a funnel and then provide them with different like valuable information. Like this is what you should do to uh, in our case, uh, prepare your land for a sale. Um, but that's not the type of information that we're giving them. So <laughs> I don't know what my question is. Is what we're doing right? I guess it isn't a point because we're, are you getting results? You're asking for a little advice from Ashley on how to better that. Well, I, I just don't know if it's the best. Yeah, I guess so. If it's the best way to handle it, I mean, we're getting twenty five percent open rate, and I'm getting about seven to nine percent click through. Um, so, I mean, that's, I could probably clean up some of the contacts on the list and get a better, better rates all the way around there. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm asking. Do I, I hear, you know, I always hear these, I'm not sure if providing content that help that gives information is what the people in this list want. I, I think they want the product that's available. Well, and I would say, so from your open rate, you're above, I was just checking what the benchmark was. Yeah, you're above average on your open rate. So industry average in real estate is almost 22%. You're a 25 and you're double on the click rate, right. um, which is which is great. Um, I think if you're not sure, the the best way would be to just, you could experiment and see what, you could send out a couple of, um, of emails and like on, you know, what if they just bought their land and it's, um, you know, how to, how to, you know, prepare your, like your new land or how to winterize right. your land or something like you could send out a couple of, um, you could test it and see what are the open rates on some of that non property related emails. Um, right. and that'll, that can be your indicator. I check your click rates, check your open rates on that. And if those are low and the, and it's not like the numbers will help give you that answer. Yeah. Uh, and collect the data. And so, cause you may very well be right that they just want to know what the properties are. Um, and I and think, uh, but what you just said, there is sending them something after they purchase, and that's a different segment. Really that's, that's focusing on seller and post sales. So that's, that's a good idea. That's something that I need to look at. Well, and if they're buyers too, it could be, you know, what are the, the hidden things that um land buyers don't know like if this right. is their first time buying land or maybe it's their second time what are those things that those pitfalls that they would never that they wouldn't know that you do because you've been in the industry longer right. um so as they're looking at um you know buying land, or as they're looking at your properties how can they actually look at your properties with a more discerning eye um that those can be some topics that you could that you could write about and then again check the numbers and see uh mm -hmm. if they're responding and if you're getting you know, if you're getting some really great metrics on it, or you're starting to see some, some more activity, um, cause it positions sending those other emails. The intention is not to add anything more on your to do plate is to position right. you as a credible authority in what you do. 
Um, but if you're not sure, I would test it out and just, you could probably write with how much, you know, you could write out two or three emails pretty, pretty, pretty easily and, and just test it and just mm -hmm. stagger it out over a few weeks. What about instead of doing test emails, sending out just an email to the whole group asking if they would find the information beneficial, like doing a survey or a poll? Yeah, you could do that too, for sure. And say, you know, give them, give them some ideas. Cause if they're on your list um, and they, maybe they, maybe they bought before, maybe they haven't, they may not know what they don't need to know. Right. Or not, you know, they don't know what they don't know. Right. Um, so you could design a, a very short survey or you could have them just, I don't know how big your list is. Um, they could either take, you, know, you link it to a survey or just say, hit reply and let me know some of the, the things you're, that make you nervous about or unsure about you know, buying land right now. And then that can give you some really great market research uh, for creating content if there's an appetite for it. Right, yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. Thank you so much, Ashley. You're welcome. And somebody else just made a comment, maybe make a, maybe create a free doc, uh, a document that give away information such as buying land checklist. Right, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Great. Well, thank you so much for those comments and thank you, Ashley, for responding in such a great way to exchange the information. So all of you can see sort of how this interacts with your, your own emails that you're sending out. Does anybody else have any other questions that they would like to ask at this time? Do you have any closing comments you'd like to give Ashley Cook to the rest of us here before we move on to, and by the way, somebody asked, when is your next class? It is this coming Wednesday. I mean, yeah. No, Thursday. 3 Thursday, uh, 3 p.m. And uh, building a high quality email list part two yes. coming up. So don't miss that. But I'll, I'll be That's telling good. you about the other things coming up this month right after that. Please, Ashley, if you have any closing comments, please go ahead and in five us. The only thing I would encourage y'all to do is to test it. And um, again, if you have any questions you're, uh, or you're uncertain, test it out. Like I love, um, I love Lynn's question around, well, could I do a survey? Absolutely, you can do a survey. Like your email list is, is full of people who, um, that, that you're building a relationship with. So if you have questions about whether or not you should do something, you can call it market research and ask for that. Uh, if you're not sure if you wanna change up something in your style or your subject line, test it out. Um, it's really kind of freeing yourself up to have fun and play with this element of email marketing and seeing how you can serve your audience better and um, approaching it from that playful testing. Let's just see what happens uh, can take some of that pressure off uh, of having to try to get it perfect because there's there's no perfection on email marketing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's been great uh, and I look forward to part two. I'm going to share a little bit of information for you guys uh, about what's coming up just to keep you informed because there are plenty of things coming up here towards the end of the month. We have budgets in QuickBooks with Stacy Kildall. She'll be uh, joining us on the 24th as well. And of course, later that afternoon, building a high quality email list part two with Ashley Cook. Don't miss it. On the 29th, coming up at the end of the month, QuickBooks and apps also with Stacy. Gildall as we finish up some of the series about QuickBooks. If you haven't been attending them, don't forget those links in the chat box. Go back in time, catch up, and come join us for these upcoming uh, webinars that are that will be here this month. There's also going to be a survey that you will be asked to please respond to. It takes you literally one minute and 37 seconds. I tried it. So one minute, 37 seconds to let us know how we're doing with this training and what you would like to do in the future to get more training on as business owners or entrepreneurs. So just to let you know, um, we are again grant funded and I wanna thank a few people. Um, I wanna thank the Small Business Administration, the state of Texas, North Central Texas College as well. And they're the ones that go together to make all of this happen to you at absolutely no cost, where you can go to our website and get information or uh, more information for your uh, business or even schedule time with an advisor to get some personal confidential one-on-one -on -one business advising. So please join us anytime you want on our website. It's at the bottom there, sbdc.nctc.edu, or you can go to our QR code button in the very top. And thanks for that thumbs up, Naomi. Uh, in the 
Q, the QR code in the top right to get upcoming webinars as they happen. We're always trying to change it and keep things for you in the future. So we thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time. And this will conclude our webinar for this afternoon. You have an amazing week, everybody.